Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to uh, the first live interverse in quite a long time. And as you might have caught from the title, the reason that I wanted to talk from my quarantine bunker is about the coronavirus that there's no way you don't know about. There's no way you haven't thought about it. And it's a pretty fear-filled situation when it comes to the messages that we see coming across our screens, especially as the scenario seems to, I guess, keep ramping up. And Zane Daniel, longtime pal of mine and multiple appearing guest on the podcast, decided he wanted to go live with me, share some of his perspectives about what we can personally do, especially in our hearts and minds to help this situation unfold smoothly and with as little problems as possible. Don't make things worse than they are, so to speak. But anyway, let's get started, Zane. I'm happy to talk to you, dude. It's always good to see you. Your van's looking awesome as always. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing great. I love talking to you. We should just do this every weekend. <laughs> I mean, maybe <laughs> so, maybe so. I, I'm trying to find more time to do these types of impromptu and less conventional styles of podcasting because I'm finally getting a pretty good handle on my process when it comes to the main weekly show. Mm -hmm. I'm stoked to sure. say that because of the Corona quarantine, I had nothing distracting me from doing uh, the entire episode for this week within like two days. Interviewed on Friday, wrapped it up in production, and I'm publishing it later today. So that's pretty cool. There's some upsides and there's some productivity that we can achieve if we're hunkering down at home. Right. So uh, I, I read your blog post that you made about coronavirus. I guess we could kind of start there because, yeah, you know, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on viruses or really anything, but it's still always good to look at things from the perspective of love. And I know that that's a big part of the theme in the blog post you made. Why don't you tell people where they can find that and let's talk about it. Oh, Sure. Yeah, that's on my website on zanedaniel.com. Like you can do zanedaniel.com slash blog, and then it'll be the first post, I think. Yeah, it'll be the first post on the list. Um, yeah, I mean, it hit me kind of a couple of days ago that, you know, pretty much on the day that everything got canceled and we realized that, oh, crap, this is this is a thing. Um, I kind of was still seeing a lot of posts from people that were saying things like, uh, this is overblown. This is being uh, turned into a sensationalized media event. This is this is a bunch of crap. We shouldn't have to do all this, you know, so on and so forth, like this kind of negativity about the action that we're taking. And I had watched two different uh, interviews by medical professionals. One was actually on Joe Rogan and, and really and the other one was uh, a live interview with an Italian um, doctor who was dealing with the, the influx of patients in that hospitals, one of the hospitals there. And both in both cases, they got to speak for a nice long time. So it wasn't just these little sound bitey kind of moments. It wasn't just a, you know, let's just take the, the most fear ridden sentence from this, you know, particular medical professional and, and throw it up there to the audience. It was actually a, let's sit down and really discuss this and really understand what it is that we're experiencing. And so that really gave me a lot more insight, I felt, uh, into what was going on. And I think that in both cases, what I realized, the number one thing that I realized is that, yes, uh, it is more dangerous for, for a particular demographic, um, the elderly and the health compromised. Um, and, and so, yes, the, the young and strapping are going to be fine and they probably won't even have that severe of symptoms, if any symptoms at all, because the very young and strapping don't even develop any symptoms, which means they're just little carriers, which is, you know, really a problem. But, but anyway, so all of this hysteria and all this madness and all these things that we're doing is specifically for that problem group not to panic and worry the people that are not in the, in that group at all. It's for a particular group. And, and they don't look at it like, well, because it's not going to hurt the young, um, then we're not going to make a big deal out of this and, and let, and let the elderly and the health compromise just perish like, yeah, whatever, 
right? It's got to be a, a worldwide kind of effort to make sure that that particular demographic is protected. And so I got to thinking about that. And of course, you know, that's the medical community's approach. Every life matters. And it's like, oh yeah, right. And, and so those that are concerned or, or worried about the fear element of it, which yes, there is definitely that, um, that is almost secondary to the unconditional love aspect of it, which is care for everyone and care for everyone equally. And so as that kind of realization seeped into me from watching those two interviews, I thought, oh, wow, I've got to try to let people know about this because this is kind of an unprecedented experience. I, I was thinking about, you know, when's the last time there was some sort of global teamwork effort for some, you know, big goal or reason. And I can't think of one in my lifetime. Uh, maybe, you know, 9-11 was a, a, was a United States wide goal or effort where people inconvenienced themselves and they couldn't travel and all of that. But this is a global. And, and what's really interesting about it is that if you think about it from the unconditional love aspect, we have to care for all of the people, uh, no matter what their demographic, then you go, wow, this is actually a global unconditional love effort. And we're really inconveniencing ourselves for this particular group. We are taking and not being able to go to sporting events and not being able to go to rallies and other interesting, um, you know, fun things that we do. It's amazing when you, when you start to go, oh, that got canceled and oh, that got canceled and oh my gosh, you know, colleges and, and you just, you, you don't even realize how much we gather. And so that's a huge inconvenience. And then it turns into a financial inconvenience for those who only make their money off of um, gatherings, myself included, although I make some money otherwise, but I'll make a lot of it off of gatherings because I, you know, I have groups of people that I speak to. Um, and so I can't do that now. And, and then all kinds of other ramifications as a result of that, there's, there are stores and so forth that, and restaurants that now are in jeopardy because nobody's going to the sporting event, which means that nobody's going to their restaurant in order to, you know, fulfill their, their, their livelihood. And then, uh, and then others may run into more and more people as they kind of isolate themselves, not going to particular types of luxury experiences like a spa, for instance, like maybe people aren't going to go to spas anymore because that's a big community kind of thing, like a Korean spa. So there's all kinds of ramifications, right? And so really, when you think about it from that perspective, again, wow, we are really sacrificing a lot for a select group in our society. And we should really celebrate that. And we should recognize that we're doing that. And we should feel good about the fact that we're doing that. And we should have, take this opportunity to say, you know what, even though I'm going to lose money because I'm not doing the thing that normally makes me money, or we're going to have a recession and there's going to be lots of problems as a result. And we can look at that and go, but, but you know what, it's for love. And so it's worth it. And I know that I'll be okay because the one thing that we are good at is adapting and adjusting. And that's what we're going to have to do. We have to adapt and we have to adjust to this new situation. And again, we can be proud, ourselves, proud of ourselves for doing it. So that's kind of like the first thought, the first message in a, in a nutshell. Yeah, and I think that that's a good perspective that, you know, whether or not you feel like you have a choice or you feel like your personal freedoms are being restricted by what's going on, if you make the mindset that the reason why it matters is because you don't want to see old people or immunocompromised people bite the dust in mass, because I don't, then, no. you know, that is a good reason. And th there, we have abundance all around us. So even with the, I, the scary idea of a recession, I don't see why things couldn't just bounce back. I mean, yeah, you can't go out and do things. You can't make money in outings, but you're also not going out and spending money in the same way either. And I think that stuff will probably even out. My one point that I guess is sticking into my mind, though, is that comparison you made to 9-11. And there's, you know, there's really some other comparisons you can make 
to the situation in 9-11, particularly that back in October, there was a, I think the World Health Organization organized it or something, this thing called Event 201. And it was like a combined effort between the World Bank and the Bill Gates Foundation and a few kind of nefarious or shady (laughs) groups, honestly, where Mm. they simulated in October a coronavirus outbreak that became a worldwide pandemic and they simulated the economy being slashed by like 15 or 20 percent. And the reason I bring this up is not because I'm saying outright that this was a planned release or some kind of experimental biological warfare. Although there's people that have gone that route and explored those ideas. And as always, I can honestly say, I don't know. I can say that there's definitely interesting evidence that could support it. But at the end of the day, you can't know. But the point is 9-11 had the same type of deal as do a lot of what you would call false flag operations or social engineering experiments by the masters, (laughs) the powers that should not be. They did that exact thing on 9-11 where they (laughs) pretended that there was planes hijacked and flying into buildings on that day. And it confused the emergency responders quite a bit because they're like, is this real world or is this exercise? And so my reason for bringing this up is that it is a little concerning how easily everything can kind of be ground to a halt through the uh, fear mongering of media or through the, 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 even if this was not, if this wasn't a real situation, it would be just as likely that a lot of this could still blow up the way that it is because people get their news from the screen and it's very easy to, make things look worse than they are, especially when you get higher ratings as a cable news channel because you are selling the fear thing. So at the end of the day, it's possibly not really as bad as it looks, or maybe it is. And I'm only bringing this up because we just don't know what's going on. And I want to keep in mind that our personal freedoms are important and I don't want anything to bubble up in the global stage that causes people to now decide that it's all right to give up personal freedoms or cede the power of the people towards a uh, centralized control more than it already is. So like to, there's a New York times article that I saw that was also really weird and it weird and interesting in a kind of troubling way, which this author was talking about how uh, you have an advantage if you're a climate change activist because of this coronavirus thing, because it's going to cause a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions to go down and you, it's going to make people who are old uh, and resistant to changing their ways because of climate change possibly die and no longer be part of the so-called problem. And just to me, that was just like a really freaky mindset that somebody out there could be writing on a big platform and saying something like, well, it's really good that this is happening because it helps us achieve our agenda of taking more granular control of everything on earth through the reasoning of climate change. So there's a couple of my more conspiratorial perspectives Mm -hmm. on on the subject. I'm not saying that we shouldn't still sort of get what, the program and go along with trying to do this uh, social distancing thing, because at the end of the day, if something's really going on and you were a carrier and you caused some people to get sick that weren't ready or able to handle that, that does suck in a big way. I mean, you don't want to be, you don't want to do that. And we are all capable of making a few sacrifices for the greater good. It's just to me, I want to make sure that we realize what the true greatest good is, which is, freedom and uh and not having draconian tyrannical centralized control measures rolled out with anything as the excuse virus or not so that's like one thing that definitely has been on my mind throughout all this again not saying i know what's going on but uh it's it's definitely a two-sided coin we're looking at (laughs) right i understand and and you know, I believe that 9-11 was a big conspiracy and, and all that. So there's there's no way to know for sure whether this is or isn't. And it could just as easily be as it isn't. So I'm not worried, though, about it. And, and the reason I'm not worried about it is because 
we are again resilient and the longer that we you know the, there are people that just want to resist right they want to go no we're going i'm going to do social um closening instead of social <laughs> distancing right and and we're just going to you know f them right and the problem with that is that if you want it to be over sooner then the only way to do it is to actually follow the social distancing approach because as long as there are still cases out there, then there's still going to be this, well, (laughs) yeah, but it could still blow up. So in order to get the cases to go away, we have to allow it to go away and give it the time for it to, to go away. So, you know, I understand your perspective for sure, but, but at this point, it just feels like the best thing to do is to follow all that and, and use your best judgment. Again, if what you, any decision that you have to make, you can ask yourself, why am I making, why do I want to make this decision versus this decision? Do I want to make this decision because F them? Or do I want to make this decision because unconditional love? And if you choose the unconditional love decision, you are always making the right move, always. And anytime, if you look back and you go, oh, shoot, I didn't have to do all of that. You can go, but it's okay because I did it with love. Or, oh, it didn't, it still didn't work and millions of people perished from the disease. Well, I still did everything that I could with love. And it's terrible, a horrible tragedy. But at least I know that fact. So when it all is said and done, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, and even if a great tragedy comes about, one of the, I mean, there's always a silver lining, right? One of the most common outcomes of any calamity is that the good people connect and pull together and do good things and realize their power to do good things. So this is a very easy I think it's a very easy choice too to just go ahead and kind of like lay low. I stocked up on food. I've been chilling at the house. Um, I'll work out at home. It's all good. You know, you can still go outside. Go great time to go be out in nature where there's not a lot of people to right. be, be next to anyway. There's there's definitely silver linings. I'm with you on the whole idea of better safe than sorry. I suppose is a way of looking at it. Yeah, but another. This, this is not saying this is my viewpoint, but another way of looking at this is that even the germ theory of disease is still kind of a theory. And in the ancient past, people believed that diseases and viruses and sicknesses were actually more connected to negative entity attachment and that kind of activity. And one thing that I know about negative entities is they exist in a, in the mind, in a sense, that they, they're related mm-hmm. to some sort of fear programming or fractured part of yourself that you've compartmentalized. And I bring up this perspective, not because I believe the germ theory of disease is wrong, just like pretty much everything. I'll just say, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. But I have an astrologer friend who wrote a pretty interesting post about this. A caveat, I don't, this isn't me saying this, this is just something that made me think. And I thought it was interesting. I'm going to read her post and just point out some of the astrology for the upcoming month. And because I'm sure that this is not over yet, it's only going to continue to probably intensify at the rate it's going, especially into April. But this astrologer wrote a very interesting set of questions and, and observations. She says, what if what's going on isn't just coronavirus or coronavirus at all? What if it's some kind of reverse placebo effect where people make themselves believe they're sick or believe that another illness is this thing because the symptoms do match a lot. I'll throw that in there. What if this is a big illusion to distract while major changes are made to our cultural socioeconomic power structure? Very possible. If so, the toilet paper and disinfectant industry just got really rich in a huge social media experiment. (laughs) But she points out the current astrological transits that ask us to go inward to understand what's going on here. Looking at the lunar astrology chart for the month of April in 2020, and she's a sidereal astrologer, which is different than tropical. So if these transits don't sound right, this is sidereal, which takes into account the Earth's tilt 
But she says Chiron is in Pisces and Chiron is the asteroid that represents the healer, the, the healer archetype. Pisces rules the 12th house, which rules the energies of hospitals, prisons, orphanages, quarantine and isolation, mm. monasteries and healers. So she says, what if we are seeing a fabricated hypochondriac reaction in the mass mind and the prisons are in our own minds? Or even if not, it's still very interesting that the astrology is uh, pointing out or is putting Chiron in Pisces. And we are in Pisces right now. And it is related to isolation and aloneness. It's totally that's totally true. But she says, uh, continuing, Chiron's transit here is sure to affect the psychological state of humanity. Everyone's going to feel it. Some people are going to feel the pain of imprisonment or the pain of hospitalization or of leaving a broken religious construct or the pain of healing or the pain of not being able to realize their dreams. But I'll just throw in that the other side of Chiron and Pisces and Pisces in general is that it's a really great time to explore your uniqueness and your creativity and what is important to you spiritually and what it what you really do feel internally. And she goes on to point out a lot of the other um, subtle and notable changes going on astrologically lately. But uh, specifically, she says, we've had several notable eclipses recently, and that generally means a change in power structures globally, a shift in power. Everyone's feeling a multiple planet conjunction in Sagittarius with Pluto, Saturn, and Jupiter. That means big changes. Many people will resist, but many people will embrace the changes coming. Mars is also in the mix in Capricorn, and Mars and Capricorn definitely could indicate a type of martial law situation because Capricorn is Saturn's sign, and that's the sort of ruler, um, king, the earthly powers that, that are in place, and Mars, you know, martial, Mars, <laughs> military, it's a, an obvious connection. And she says, Neptune has just entered Pisces in its rulership which means that the Piscean energy is extra strong because Neptune and Pisces are tied together. So if Neptune's in there, then we're definitely going to see a very Pisces time right now. I happen to be a Pisces sun sign, so I <laughs> find this all very interesting. And she says, Uranus squares that stellium with heavy connections to Mars. And Uranus rep is a representative of information and fluidity of connection and technology. So... It could definitely represent a war of information via online communications. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people definitely are kind of going to war, especially lately over their information. Like you're wrong. I'm right. And mm -hmm. let's, I, I won't continue reading the entire post, but it's just really interesting how astrology does reflect the things that we <laughs> see going on. And I thought that her post was pretty eye opening because I don't go and check the charts every day. I, right. I don't necessarily know how to interpret them that well, but I know enough to know that what she was saying here does have some validity. And so we could look at that as being just like, this is what's in the cards for us right now. <laughs> and, right. and let's, let's look at the positive sides of the isolation and the positive elements of Pisces and what Chiron and Pisces really means, which is like going within and being alone to work on yourself and to heal. So there's a lot of opportunity here for, unconditional love to ourselves instead of yes. letting ourselves feel like we're missing out or that we've had something taken away from us because of the, the quarantine and the social distancing. Yes. Thank you for that too, because you can always look at something in the negative and you can always look at something in the positive. You get to choose which one you, you want. And for those that are, you know, looking at it very negatively Take the moment, take the opportunity to try to look at the positives like you just said. It's an opportunity for isolation and healing. And the other thing is, you know, if you compare it again to 9-11, what's kind of cool about that is that by the time, you know, 2012 rolled around, there were quite a few documentaries that were kind of awakening style documentaries. Um, people that were beginning a path of enlightenment or have having just, be, you know, having it going for a little bit there. And a lot of times the, the documentarian would say, or, or they'd interview someone and they would say, you know, after nine 11, everything changed for me. And it was a trigger for so many people to begin their awakening process. 
And it's because it made you think about everything, you know, otherwise you're just going along in your, in your very kind of isolated life where you're like, I got to make money for myself and my family. I've got to try to continue to succeed in this competitive world. And then this big interruption occurs where you have all of a sudden time to think about yourself, about how the world works. And you're kind of living in the moment more. And anytime you live in the moment more, you, you invite the possibility for epiphany. You invite the possibility for this universal knowledge to just come through during a uh, quiet thought. And so this is yet another opportunity for that because now we are sitting along around at home or we're even when we're walking around and we're doing something at a grocery store and we're thinking, here comes someone coming toward me. Well, how should I respond? How should I be? How are they sick? You know, and, and you are essentially living in that moment, even though that moment is maybe a fear-based moment, as I just described, it's still a moment where you might have a, a, a chance to kind of recognize, wait a minute, what am I doing? Right. And then when you ask questions like that, who am I, what am I doing? What's going on? Then you have an opportunity for an answer to come through that is much greater than your own intelligence. And anytime we can in, incite that in people, you'll see more and more awakening. So even if, just like I, I truly believe the 9-11 thing had a, had a particular goal or mission in mind, and that was their, you know, uh, uh, what is that called? The uh, petrodollar and all that jazz, right? This the, and from a higher, you know, like a, the, the powers that should not be, as you said, they inadvertently woke up a large portion of the population. And so every time they do something like that, they risk opening up the minds and the eyes and the enlightenment and the hearts of the population. So if they want to keep doing that, okay, because I think more, it, it'll, it'll, hasten our awakening as a collected society. It will definitely take more and more people on the individual journey towards truth because looking into anything deeply can reveal deep truths about the universe and about yourself. Even if it takes a while, even if that catalyst is a seed that takes a while to germinate and, and grow, that's definitely true. Yeah. So I'm, I, you know, it, again, it's how you look at it. You could look at it negatively and, and really, you know, I've really been observing this grocery store thing. It's so fascinating to me. Um, so like, you know, I live in a camper van, right? And so I often find myself in a parking lot during the day to do my work. Um, I'm teaching a, an online course right now, uh, which I'm absolutely loving. And so I'm, I'm putting myself in a, in a grocery store parking lot because I can quickly go get something to eat. I can get some um, internet from a nearby restaurant, you know, whatever. And so I'm going into the grocery store all the time uh, just for a quick minute. And I'm realizing and I'm seeing how this whole thing happens instead of just going, you know, once and then staying at home. I'm watching as the ebb and flow comes. So people go in and they buy all the water and they buy all the toilet paper, which still confuses the heck out of me. But, but anyway, and then, you know, then a shipment comes in. And so, you know, the, the, the workers are there like frantically trying to put water on the shelves as I walk by. I'm like, oh, good. I needed a three gallon thing of water. Cool. I'll just take this now and I'm not going to hoard it. And I'm not going to worry about all that jazz because it's, it's not like the supply is going to end. <laughs> at this point. So I don't quite understand it. But anyway, so, you know, it's been, it's been very interesting to observe this kind of fear-based behavior. And as we know, fear is the lowest vibrational emotional experience that we can have. And the, the more we tie into that, the more simple and reptile uh, we are. And so it's an, it's again, it's another opportunity to observe people that are in a fear-based situation and go, okay, I don't need to be that way. I know that I'll be able to handle anything that comes at me. I know that I'm good at adapting to any situation. And so that contrast helps me recognize 
that I don't really need to be like that. And I don't want to be like that. Um, and so, but, but it sure is interesting, <laughs> right. To watch, to watch the people do all of that. Um, and, and there are consequences too, of course, like the one thing that I'm not that happy about is that they bought up all the meat and I'm like, Oh my gosh. So now that means we have to slaughter more animals at a faster rate than we were before, as if that wasn't fast already. So I'm not very happy about that. The milk and the eggs too. All the, all the animal products were just like gone, just like that. And now we have to up the production of eggs, milk and, and meat which, which, you know, you, you were saying earlier about the, the greenhouse gases, right? And, the, and the, the, that might have been a plot to, to lower the greenhouse gases. Well, it didn't work because now you have to produce even more meat, which is the biggest cause of greenhouse gases, if I understand correctly. Well, I so, wouldn't say that it was a plot to actually reduce the human impact on the climate. I see it more as possibly a different way of instituting the same types of top-down control measures that they wanted to do on a global one world government level in the name of climate change, but now in the name of dealing with the pandemic, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. So it's, it's like still a, a, it's a, a money based kind yeah. of thing. Well, yeah. 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 I mean, anyway, uh, I have also have to point out, Something I forgot to say, the astrologer who I was quoting earlier is Desiree Fultz, and I don't want to leave her without credit. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> what popped into my mind, you talked about the toilet paper thing, which I can attest is true here as well. Yeah. She mentioned in that post that Uranus is in Aries. So Aries is the god of war. So if he's entering Uranus, that's why there's a big fight over toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it might not be a real connection, but... <laughs> <laughs> Funny though. I'm glad you brought it up because toilet humor is always funny. That's true. Oh, so I wanted to draw a card from my I Ching deck just to see like if the cards will pick up on the vibe of what we're doing here. And okay. right then when I said, oh, is when I split the deck and looked at what was on top, we get, wow, it's really symbolic actually. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's card number 12, which let me hold up to the camera. It's the 12th hexagram of the I Ching. It's called standstill. Alienation, oh my a stalemate, stagnation, withholding, grinding to a halt, insensitivity, mistrust. Wow. So, wow. Yeah, that's a pretty perfect and apt description. And it's number 12, <laughs> which Pisces, as we we're talking about, that's the 12th sign of the Zodiac. So all around, there's some Ridiculous. interesting, interesting yeah. reflections there in the, uh, the I Ching that just popped out for us. I mean, I think that's pretty easy to interpret. That's the that's the vibe that things are in right now. It's kind of a wintry looking card on the imagery, and it is maybe cold in some places, but uh, I don't have a deeper interpretation of that meaning other than... It's pretty face value. Yeah, the reason why it's a standstill, actually, I will say, is that it, it's the classic yin-yang. If you look at the very top, you have the white half of the circle and the black half of yeah. the circle. What that represents in the I Ching is the... Yang energy, the masculine force in a position of dominance over the um, feminine force, the yin. And not all I Ching cards use yin or yang. They have uh, other elements. There's eight total. But the reason why that represents a standstill is because it's like a complete <laughs> balance of the, the forces in a way. Like it's just uh, canceling itself out. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what will happen because of the standstill, though. We can hope that the the problem part of the pandemic can maybe be slowed down or come to a, a standstill too, not just the economy and our lives. And I mean, a lot of people that check out this show are definitely going to be feeling it when it comes to what you're saying before, making money at events. There's a lot of artists I know that paint at festivals, do live events to sell their stuff. And I hope that all of them don't get too down about the events being canceled. Maybe increase their online hustle or just work on more art. And that way, when the events come back, they have so much new stuff that they do great or, or whatever, yeah. but there's definitely yeah. ways to make the most out of what's going on without it all being doom and gloom. I think that we've made that pretty clear, which is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've been thinking a little bit about something that you said about the negative entity attachments. I think that's a very interesting 
uh, approach or, or possibility. And it makes me want to do a global negative entity attachment um, activation to see if, uh, if, if I can help the global community remove some of their attachments. Because, you know, I do that on a one-on-one basis and can really help people. Um, but I haven't turned that toward the, the global community, mainly because it's, it's kind of frowned upon in the, in the light worker movement because you're essentially doing something without their permission. Um, but the way that you do that still is that you ask for the, the higher self permission and or you allow the, the people that are supposed to have their negative entity attachments, keep them as part of your intention with the activation. So I could definitely see doing something like that. And I could see mul- multiple light workers who are capable of removing negative entity attachments, kind of like joining together and doing that. Um, so that we, we hit all the pockets or all the wrinkles or whatever way you want to say that. Yeah. Is that something you want to do on the air? Just to, at least the people that tune into this, whether live or otherwise, looks like we didn't get a lot of live, but Hey, that's because I'm shadow banned on Facebook or can't be helped. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. Yeah. I could totally see doing something like that. I think that's a great idea. All right. Um, well, that's what we can move move into if you want. I, I don't have a whole lot else personally to say on the subject other than to one more time say, like, keep unconditional love at the forefront of your reason for doing anything and you won't be wrong. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I do want to say one little thing. I was reading a little article about so the, some of the patients who de- who develop severe complications and often die are ones that also develop something called, no, I don't know if I've, I've never said this out loud other than just <laughs> practicing, but c- cytokine or cytokine storm syndrome. And what that is, it's when your immune system actually attacks you. Um, and this happens on a, some decent percentage of this, of the patients of COVID-19 that end up perishing. And, and it, it actually kind of ties back into your whole, uh, we're causing it to ourselves kind of concept. Um, and, and what's interesting about it though, is that there are medications to help treat, treat people with cytokine storm syndrome. And they are trying that out on patients that they believe have it. But of course, it's very complicated. It's complicated to find out if they actually have that or developed it as a result of the of the of the virus. But there are certain um, um, what do you want to call that? Uh, like immune system herbs that people take when they start to get sick that boosts their immune system. And there's been a couple of warnings about doing that because you could end up inciting this, I got to look it up again, cytokine storm syndrome. So just something else that it might be kind of interesting to do your own research on and see what you think about it. Um, It was kind of new to me. I just read about it this morning. So I thought I would share. So don't overdo it, (laughs) especially if you're a person that's got maybe a delicate health situation. Talk to somebody that knows your situation and would be knowledgeable maybe before you make a whole bunch of big changes at once. That's probably, I mean, this isn't medical advice, but like, that's what I'm taking away from it. And when it comes to stuff that boosts your immune system, I can't believe I ever got to mention, if you don't use elderberry, try that because it is definitely got science behind it to show that it helps you against viruses. It helps you against infections. It's basically like a miracle. That's the one that they said, don't do. (laughs) Oh, well, that's a, who said this? Where did this come from? Right, right. I know exactly. Right, because it, it the was, people that sell the panic also sell the pill. I got exactly. Gotta oh, keep I know. That in mind. I know. I know. It's it always is can go back. Ugh, yeah, it makes it really hard to figure out what we're supposed to do. Right. I mean, um, I know of an elderberry distributor in my area because it's a really good elderberry growing region. I know. Oh, I see. A, a distributor that had so a SWAT team with guns come and raid their entire facility. Because there was a rumor that they had said that it could possibly help with cancer. 
So a SWAT team came with guns. I mean, that's the kind of that's where things are at. And that was like a, a yeah. year or two ago. But I, I to know. me, that's good evidence that elderberry is probably awesome, and you should definitely yeah. take it. <laughs> but <you laughs> right, know, right. in in the dosage of like a spoonful a day, I don't see how that's going to cause a cytokine oh. storm. I mean, I do know some people that are what you would call experts on it and yeah, yeah, they also sell it and they grow it, but I have never once heard of any bad side effects from that particular superfood. So that's yeah, one and it could be use. And it could be based on when you take it. Like if you take it before you get the virus, maybe you prevent yourself from getting it. You know, there's who knows, right? Like thinking like, is hard. You know, yeah. <laughs> right. 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 So, well, Anyway, cytokine, if somebody wants to look it up, it's C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E, cytokine storm. And then they can decide for themselves instead of listen to us dumb guys who don't know. Well, there's another <laughs> another uh, smart person that I know who actually is a scientist in nutrition and genetics, a guy named David Krantz, K-R-A-N-T-Z, definitely worth a follow. He's been on the show a while back. He sent out an email to his email list talking about uh, three good points that could possibly have an inf influence on your ability to deal with being infected or impacted by the virus. The first thing he mentioned is melatonin, and he gives links to some research about a possible connection between the inflammatory response from COVID-19 and melatonin. He says the long and short of it is that although it's a correlation and not a causation, a potential factor why children are not being impacted by the virus is that overall levels of melatonin decline significantly with age. Yeah. And melatonin is a potent inhibitor of the NLRP3 inflammasome pathway, which is what actually causes the lung and tissue damage from the viral load. Other potent inhibitors are vitamin C and nitric oxide. So he says, this is not medical advice, but he definitely used some big words that make it sound like he knew what he was talking about. And he did link <laughs> the research here, but he says he's adding a low dose of melatonin at night and upping his vitamin C and nitric oxide precursor, which you can get from beetroot powder. And he, he's increasing that intake till this blows over. And that's maybe not a bad idea. I don't yeah. take, I don't think melatonin is something you should take all the time just to get to sleep, but maybe in the case of showing up against the virus. That's not a bad idea. He says right. that it mechanistically makes sense from what he knows about how our immune system and how our body works, which he does know quite a bit. You go check out the episode he did with me and you'll be like, wow, this guy knows a lot. The second thing he says is stress inhibits the immune system's ability to fight off infection. So not panicking is pretty much a good way to do <laughs> a good way to do anything. Don't panic. Mm -hmm. And the third is sunlight and fresh air. And he links an article about how the Spanish flu outbreak back in the day, people were recovering quicker when outdoors. And I think the, you know, there's probably nitric oxide in the oxygen or in the air outside too. So those are a couple of good ideas. Oh, get yeah. outside, get some sunlight and maybe yeah, the vitamin D is <clears throat> a safe thing to take. Right. And the vitamin D from the sun is huge. You know, that, that sun energy is incredible. So yeah, that's a good one. I'm glad you you read that. That's kind of cool about the melatonin. I didn't know about that. Makes sense, though. Yeah, it's actually a time when it's good to be on someone's email list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. All right, well, let me go ahead and do a uh, um, negative entity attachment removal for anybody who listens to this. And I'm going to direct it to the world. And we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah, it can't hurt. I'm ready. Okay. And what's up, everyone that joined the stream too? Uh, we actually had a whole bunch of people jump in, and I'd love oh, cool. to, I'd love to say hi to them or answer any questions they have for us. I don't know how much of the beginning you caught, but the whole idea that we've really been trying to hammer home is not that we know what the hell is going on exactly, but that <laughs> if whatever you do in response to the situation, if you're doing it because of unconditional love, then that's the right move. So, right, you know, I guess we're recommending the basic stuff like the isolating yourself and not coughing right on people's face and all that good stuff. Yeah. Because yeah, sure. The young people are immune to it or don't have uh, severe consequences generally from COVID-19, but the elderly, the health compromised seem to, and some reports say that 
the health health compromise, uh, it's a 50% mortality rate. So if that's if that's in fact true, then the things that we're doing right now where we are isolating ourselves is for unconditional love for them, not just saying, oh, well, we'll all be fine. So who cares about them? Um, that's actually absolutely the opposite of unconditional love. So I'm I'm encouraging everybody to do that. And just like um, Chance said, when making a decision, ask yourself, is this for unconditional love? And if it is, then you're making the right decision. And no matter what happens, you can look back and you can say, hey, at least what I did, I did for love, no matter what the consequences were. That the health co- health co- all right. Well, all right, man. All right, man. Let's uh, do that little session that you had planned for us and sure. see where we go from there. Okay. So what, um, one of the things that Chance brought up was that uh, there was, who was it that said that they thought that it would be a, uh, a negative entity attachments? Oh, I, I don't know if anyone's saying that specifically, but in the, I was just bringing up how I don't know. I don't know for sure. I don't claim to know for sure about just about anything, especially <laughs> stuff that has the word theory at the end of it. And although it seems like pretty solidly true, the germ theory of disease still has the word theory on it. Mm, and mm-hmm. like everything that people thought was a hundred percent true. Eventually at some point later, people were like, they were so wrong about how that worked. And right. so I'm, I, I bring that up because in the long ago, people actually associated disease and virus and things like that and pandemics and outbreaks with dark forces, you know, negative entities, attachments. And I don't claim to think that that's the case for, every type of illness that anyone ever has. But when you look at how people deal with stuff like cancer, for example, getting their mind right and healing themselves on a consciousness level usually is a requirement. And when I say negative entity attachment, I'm not talking about demons or aliens. I'm talking about a compartmentalized part of yourself that you splintered off and shoved aside and not loved anymore or rejected and how this type of internal fragmenting has a lot to do with our ability to show up as healthy and vibrant humans in the world. And sometimes there's definitely direct correlations with this type of mental turmoil or mental schisming with the way our bodies end up going weird and going wrong. And Mm -hmm. there's definitely connections there. I mean, as a light worker and energy healer, I've personally witnessed you help people make a connection to a traumatic memory or a, a a negative self perspective with some kind of pain or some kind of chronic problem in their body. So although there's possibly something more going on when it comes to the way that this <clears throat> virus is spreading, it definitely never hurts to just go ahead and try to bring all of the pieces of ourselves back together with a type of energy healing or what you could call negative entity attachment. I call it a negative entity because it's a part of yourself that you've rejected and made into negative and it's become its own entity inside you. But there's a lot of other ways you might categorize it. At the end of the day, I think we're talking about the same thing, whether it's Mm -hmm. demons or whether it's more of this like archetypal way of looking at these things. Right. Yeah. And, and I've dealt with negative entity attachments on lots of people and I've seen it have all kinds of different sorts of consequences. Uh, There was a a woman who had gone to an event. This was like last year, I believe. And she knew that she had uh, contracted some sort of negative entity attachment when she was at the event. It gave her, I think it was like a vertigo feeling, um, uh, a heavy weight. Uh, she, She was kind of almost bedridden, like she couldn't really work. And luckily she knew someone who was a friend of mine And that friend of mine said, oh my gosh, you've got to see Zane. And so we did a quick session for her and it was immediate. It was instantaneous. As soon as I did the the negative entity removal activation, she was just up and and able to function perfectly normally and was able to go right back to work and it was over. So they can do all kinds of crazy things to us. Uh, And I don't really even understand completely because just because I can get rid of them doesn't mean I want to study them. Um, I want to study unconditional love. I don't want to study negative entity attachments. So all I know is I can tell when people have them and I can remove them 
And so I'm going to do that. So we're going to do that for those that are listening, but I'm also going to set it for uh, my intention for the whole world. And again, if anybody's concerned about asking permission for that, I'm going to allow their higher selves to interfere um, with that if the person is supposed to have that um, negative entity attachment. I'm not going to meddle with that. But for those who are ready for it to be removed uh, at, at all levels, at a soul level and at as, as a, um, uh, an incarnation level, then it will hopefully be effective for them. And so that's, that's what we're going to do. So when everybody's ready, you can just go ahead and close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath. And feel yourself relax as you exhale. Feel yourself sinking into the chair that you're sitting in. Feel the temperature of the room that you're in. Feel that your clothes against your body. This is a nice and quick process. So I'm going to say the words breath in. And when I do, you'll take a nice big deep breath. You'll hold it at the top and you'll wait for me to say the word awaken. <clears throat> So removing the entity attachments from the world. Breath in. Awaken. Well, I'm definitely continuing to feel the feedback, which it is not usual, not normal. So that's good. And then for those that are listening and for the world, I'm going to also activate your halo chakras. The halo chakra is the one above the crown, above the base seven. And it, of course, it's called the halo chakra because it's about where a halo would be should you have one. And its purpose is to protect you from negative entities and uh, negative energies. It also has the ability to kind of make changes to your dream state. So I've had people that had night terrors and then after we activated the halo chakra, the night terrors went away. Um, there was a, a, a young girl who their family was seeing like apparitions and, and weird ghostly entities in their house. And as soon as we activated just that little girl's halo chakra, uh, those entities and apparitions went away. So it has all kinds of different function. And so we're going to go ahead and do that right now too. I'll be probably doing a tone for this. Yes. He in the halo chakra for the world. Breath in. Awaken. Receiving similar feedback as to the last time. Normally it's kind of over quickly, but it persists. So when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Well, I appreciate this, Zane. It's always cool to be party to one of your, or two activations in this case. The way I like to think about these things is that the universe is a mental construct, primarily and completely created through our imagination. And so we have someone like yourself that can confidently and competently with unconditional love, show us a way or a reason why that we're, you know, that we're safe, that we're protected, that we're okay, then we can believe it. We have sort of like a symbol in our external reality that represents the us making the choice that this halo chakra energy is now online and that the whatever attachments or 
astral parasites or, you know, shadow energy harvesting little invisible bugs that might be crawling around in our, <laughs> in our etheric bodies. It's, it's up to us that we make the decision that those things are going to be integrated and uh, put back into their right place and balanced. And I appreciate whenever we get the chance to do something like this, it was really cool. And I hope that everybody out there listening realizes that they are as safe and protected as can be that destiny is a real thing. You're not ever going to miss out on your destiny Everything that is coming your way, everything that you experience on a higher self level is part of your reason for incarnating. And it's your perspective that you're here to heal and shift more than anything. What is is what is. And what's important is the reason why, the meaning that we give it. And just like we started off talking about, if the reason why and the reason we did anything is for unconditional love, whether unconditional love for ourself, which is possibly the most important or unconditional yeah. love for anybody in the world or the world itself. That is definitely the answer. Love is the answer. Classic, but true. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have said it better myself. Beautiful chance. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Yeah. I think we should maybe go ahead and wrap this up. We are at about an hour. That sounded like a good amount of time for me. Whenever we are yeah. planning this, maybe do an hour and it seems to have just kind of, Falling on that point uh, right at the end of the activation seems like that's the period on the sentence for me or exclamation point. <laughs> it's really cool. Right. Yeah. Not a question mark, but an exclamation point. Maybe a question mark and an exclamation point. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That'd be like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I, to me, like what I mean by that is that the, the questioning is super important and the answers sure. are. There, there's no final answer to anything. The quest, the question is the quest. The question right. is the answer, right? Like, the only thing, right. The only thing we know is that we know nothing. Yeah. And that nothing is also everything, oddly enough. Right. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, remind people what else you do, where they can find you for more. Tell them about your comic while, while we've got them here. Let's wrap this up proper. Okay. Sounds good. So yeah, so uh, you can go on to my website. Actually, um, I do activations, all kinds of different activations like, like uh, the, the negative entity attachment one that we just did. And if you go on to my website, if you go on to free.zanedaniel.com and Zane Daniel spelled with an X, X-A-N-E, and then Daniel like the first name. If you go there, then you get to download another activation for free. Um, and you'll sign up for my mailing list and that, that helps me. So it's a nice exchange. Um, and, uh, so, you know, you can see that I do lots of different activations. Um, I'm right in the middle of an online course right now. And once that's done, I'll open that up again. And so if you're interested in taking a course on defaulting to happy, uh, it raises your vibration quite a bit. Um, it's, it's, it's goal is to ha find happiness peace and remain unflappable every day. Um, as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions where I can remove um, burden, childhood burdens, um, uh, actually enhance your spiritual gifts and all kinds of wonderful things like that. And you can find out all about that on the website. Then also I write and publish my own comic book series called Righteous about a greedy corporate analyst who is visited by a being of light that touches him on the forehead and changes him so that he can only help others and he can't be greedy anymore. And the twist is that every time he helps someone, he passes it on to them too in a disease-like fashion, which is really fascinating right now. Um, and that is a long ongoing series. Uh, we, we've got 13 chapters done almost to 14, almost done with 14. And, uh, and it's gonna go on for a long time and, and Chance has read it and, and he's a big fan. So uh, if he likes it, you're going to like it too. And that's uh, righteouscomic.com. And it's also a similar th thing I've got set up. If you go free.righteouscomic.com, you can download the first uh, chapter for free off the website. Yeah, very good. People go check it out. Definitely worth reading. After chapter one, you'll be like in. So go get a copy and help Zane with his inability to go to public speaking events for a little while. That's always yes. good. 
share the, <laughs> share the money you've saved by not going out by <laughs> supporting a really good creator here and stay tuned for his future online courses and stuff. Definitely go check out zanedaniel.com. And also don't forget if you're not an interverse subscriber, you can subscribe to the regular show that is usually longer than this, but we do a weekly show with people like Zane and you can find it everywhere. Podcasts are served, Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube. It's all there. So thanks for checking it out. And we are really happy that you are hopefully in agreement with us that unconditional love is the way to approach even what seems to be a scary situation, which is, which is really just a strange emergence of change. And yeah, let, don't let the uh, don't let the strange change you away from your decision to act lovingly and be loving to yourself and others. And I guess that's the uh, that's the end of it. Right. Well, I mean, it's like it, you, unconditional love is the highest vibrational emotional experience you can have. And fear is the lowest vibrational emotional experience that you can have. So it's interesting that we're talking about the highest versus the lowest, not any of the ones in between. So which would you rather do? I mean, it's pretty obvious that avoid the fear thing because you'll figure it out. It'll all be okay. And pursue the loved one because it's not, the loved one is not selfish like the fear one is. The loved one is helping all and helping yourself. So it's an obvious choice. And, and, but yet when we tune in to, yeah, when we tune into all the negativity, it's very easy to go down here. So I understand. Yeah. So maybe don't watch too much news. (laughs) All right. Right. (laughs) All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.